Hi everyone, today I'd like to talk through the synthesis of this molecule dimedone. During the retrosynthesis, I will identify both 1, 3 and 1, 5 functional group relationships that I can use to plan my strategy. I'll then present an example of a forward synthesis that would work for this situation. I'm hoping to present the organic chemistry here in a slightly casual way, and if you enjoy the style of this presentation, please do give the video a like and consider subscribing to my channel. Okay, the first thing I notice about this molecule is it's very symmetrical, so I want to keep an eye on that as I go through my retrosynthesis. I notice there's two functional groups, two ketones, and there's two ways I could look at this molecule. I'm just going to number it in two different ways. Either we could consider those two ketones to be one, three apart, or counting the other way around the ring, we could consider them to be one, five. Now, this will lead us to two different choices in our first disconnection. So to start with, I'm going to explore the 1,5 disconnection. So this is a so-called 1,5 difunctionalized compound. This type of disconnection is very strongly linked to conjugate addition type methodology or 1,4 addition or Michael addition is another way of phrasing that. The disconnection therefore will go in this sort of position between the 3 and the 4 or the 2 and the 3. And this will take me back to some sort of conjugate acceptor, so an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl and the other methyl group there. Now, one thing I'll note is that this sort of disconnection is really breaking the symmetry of the situation for us straight away. So I might be a bit concerned about this as a strategy for going forwards. To think about this a bit further, I'm gonna think about what I would need to do to do the reverse of this disconnection. So I'm, I'm setting up a situation where I need to form a nucleophile in this position, um, potentially some sort of enolate. In an ideal world, if I want it to attack in this position, I also require it to be a soft enolate. Now, the first thing I have to ask myself is, how do I get the enolate to form in that position in the first place? And this is quite tricky because this molecule has several positions um, which are able to enolize. So noticeably, all of these positions drawn in red are positions where an enolate could form by deprotonation. Now, I might be able to argue that the and the position that I want to analyze at is the least hindered of the positions, and I might be able to get some directing effects of it being alpha to a carbonyl. But at the end of the day, we are skewered by going down this mechanism by this acidic proton in the middle here, which has a pKa around 10, and all of the other pKa's of the other protons highlighted before will be more towards the 20 end of things. So it's going to be very hard for us not to be able to form the enolate in the position indicated in green as opposed to where we actually want it to go. So for now, I'm just going to abandon this route as a strategy. The alternate disconnection would be looking at the 1-3 relationship, so the 1-3 difunctionalized uh, route. And this is strongly associated with uh, enolate chemistry uh, directly, and specifically using aldol type reactions. This time I'm going to disconnect between two and three at the top. And this will take me back to something like this. And I've actually got quite a lot of choice of what I put in as my new carbonyl group here. I'm going to need to form the enolate in this position here. So I can worry about that in a second. Just thinking what, what X could be. If X equals hydrogen and I have the aldehyde in here, I would form the beta hydroxy ketone as my product, which is fine. But perhaps a smarter move is to set X to be equal to OET, as in I'm going to have the ester functional group. That means if I were to do the attack of the enolate onto the ester, I would be able to eject the OET minus leaving group and go straight to the dicarbonyl product that I want at the end. This idea also has the added advantage of uh, making sure my intermediates are a bit more easy to handle. Now here I can have a quick evaluation of my forward synthesis. So I probably will be able to deprotonate in the position where I want to, uh, next to the carbonyl in that position, it is the most sterically accessible place as well, should that be a concern. Now, when I try to form the ring from the enolate in that position indicated in purple, I'll be forming a six-membered ring. I also note at this point that there are other places I could enolize, such as here. But if I were to try to do some sort of um, attack onto a carbonyl group, I'll be forming a four-membered ring, which isn't so favorable. There is a further place where I could enolize alpha to a carbonyl, which is here, but again, there would be a four-membered ring forming if I were to attack across to the other carbonyl. Okay, so this is looking like a good first disconnection, so I'm just going to number again, one, two, three, four, five. And now I don't really have a choice. I have a one, five dicarbonyl species, so I have to disconnect using the conjugate addition type methodology that we discussed before. So now I have a choice that is different if I cut between two and three and three and four. Now we'll see why later, but this will turn out to be better if I cut between three and four. 
that will take me back to this alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyl, and also ethyl acetate, which um, is a commonly available solvent. So I'm going to propose to use that as my reagent. So now that I'm proposing an intermolecular reaction, it's more important that I definitely get a soft enolate in this position. That's so that I can get attack at this soft electrophilic center. And these alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl compounds, they can act as electrophiles either at the 1,4 position as indicated there, or also directly to do 1,2 addition. Hard nucleophiles will select the direct addition and um, soft nucleophiles encourage thermodynamic reversibility and selection for the 1,4 addition. Now it turns out this alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl is actually commercially available anyway, but I will note that um, if I were to disconnect this further, I would be picking to disconnect the alkene of the alpha beta and saturated carbonyl. Standard methods for dealing with that type of disconnection would be either an aldol or a Wittig type reaction to form the CC double bond. And it turns out there's a bit of symmetry going on here because if I were to propose to disconnect here, that would take me back to acetone as one of the components and also acetone as the other component. This is because now if I were to enolize one of these and do the aldol reaction, after E1CB elimination, I will get the product directly. So I should be okay just putting acetone in with some, say, sodium methoxide to get the condensation reaction to happen easily. Acetone is particularly prone to this self-condensation type reaction because it's not very hindered. So now dealing with this soft enolate, there are a potential few ideas that I have in my head, one of which we have to be careful to avoid, which is to use an enamine here, because trying to form the enamine on an ester will just result in forming the amide. So that's a no-go for this. So the reagent that I'm going to employ for doing this is to make a functional group into conversion and go back to the diethyl malonate. Now I mentioned before that the protons between these two carbonyl groups have a particularly low pKa of around 10. This means that the enolate formed in this position is particularly stable and therefore will behave as a soft nucleophile. Okay, and in thinking about my forward synthesis, I'm going to have to worry about how I get rid of one of these ester groups, but I would expect to be able to do this by some sort of decarboxylation. So now I have to think about the consequences of some of my thoughts on the retrosynthesis and how they will impact my forward synthesis. So starting with diethylmalonate, um, I need to deprotonate it with some sort of base. And a good choice here would be ETO minus the epoxide ion. This has a pKAH of about 15, whereas the protons we're about to deprotonate have a pKa of about 10. So there'll be some equilibrium here. And that will turn out to be tolerated by the rest of this synthesis. Now I have my soft enolate. If it was presented with the acetone self-condensation product, I would expect it to do conjugate addition like this. This step again will be reversible because I would expect the um, E1CB reverse reaction to be plausible with the diethylmalonate enolate as a stable leaving group. Now I've generated an enolate in the same molecule as some electrophilic esters. But I'm actually okay here because if I were to try to form uh, a ring using the enolate as a nucleophile onto one of those carbonyls, I'd be forming a four-membered ring. So in equilibrium, that would just reverse and reopen if it formed in the first place. Now cleverly, I picked a base whose conjugate acid will still be hanging around in solution in, the, in ethanol. So that will be able to act as a proton source to protonate that enolate at this point. If I'd picked sodium hydride, say, in my first step, I would have lost hydrogen gas and there would be no proton available at this stage. Given the pKa's and pKaH's involved here, we would expect this to be in equilibrium as well. And we note how we can see the reverse of that reaction can be done by deprotonating there with the epoxide that we've just generated. But there is another proton down here that can be deprotonated in equilibrium to form a different enolate. Now this enolate allows us to do something different because we, we've set it up as a nucleophilic centre in a 1,6 relationship from a carbonyl. So I should be able to do uh, an ester condensation along this lines to kick out another ethoxide. Now this reaction is also reversible, but I'd imagine it's very biased over to the ring closed product here. The intramolecular reaction, of course, increases entropy. You've got one molecule going to two. And we've also formed a new carbon-carbon bond in this step. Now we're very close to my target molecule here, so all I need to do is get rid of this group. And I'm going to propose to do that by a classical decarboxylation reaction. 
So at this stage, I would have separated out my um, molecule that I've generated from the ring closure reaction and treated it separately with sodium hydroxide. This will saponify the ester down to the carboxylic acid. And now if I treat this with a strong acid such as HCl and I heat it, I can lose carbon dioxide. Uh, this is a decarboxylation reaction and I get my target molecule. Now the mechanism for that step is perhaps a little unfamiliar to some. It involves a pericyclic reaction, which is when our arrows go round in a ring. So I'm just going to redraw my carboxylic acid, which is quite likely to sit in this conformation anyway, when there's a hydrogen bond possible between the hydrogen and the oxygen there. Pushing the arrows round in a ring will generate this enol form and carbon dioxide gas, which then could just tautomerize in acid to my product. The keto form is generally more stable. Okay, that's me done for today. If you enjoyed the style of this presentation, uh, do consider giving this video a like. And if you want to see more content along these lines, please do subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.